He gave me this sheet, and uh, it's wonderful. Everything that you need to know is here. But uh, I'm going to jump out of your box, but I'm going to hold on to this to know that I don't go too far off. So the first thing you want to know is who I am and how old I am, and oh gosh, and that biographical stuff. All right, I'm Lillian Thomas Burwell. And I put the Thomas in my name all the time now because uh, I'm no longer Mrs. Burwell, but I'll always be Miss Thomas because I always have that. Father is very much an influence on everything that I am and everything that I have become. I wish you were alive to see all my good news now. Um, I'm 84 years old, uh, physically. The spirit's something else. I feel like I'm just beginning in a lot of ways. Um, my parents were both very creative people. It just so happened that they were teachers. That's sort of incidental in a way. But they met in 1921 when they were both teaching at A&T, what was an institute, now it's university, in Greensboro. He was teaching photography. She was teaching arts and crafts and English. And that's when they met, teaching, they both teaching as part of a summer school faculty there. Um, but even more than what they did, their influence on me was because they were, by nature, very creative people. In other words, I think that growing up during the Depression had an awful lot to do with it. They met in 26, I was born in 27. You, you know what happened in 29? Yep, my mother was born that year, but the stock market crashed. The stock market <laughs> crashed. And in those olden days, uh, people usually stayed engaged a long time until they were in the position for not a good, substantial family life. So they were engaged a long time, saved up, so that when they got married, they left faculty at A&T. And they moved to Miami, where Daddy opened up his business as part of the home that they also purchased at that time. Now, all this is in 26. But when 29 came, and I was two years old, they lost everything they had. So they were part of the migration north that sent us to try to find a way to eat, to support the family. And nothing could be luckier than having that empty basket that everything filled in, in the course of my growing up. Uh, because of the kind of people that they were, creative in their thinking. Uh, and growing up in the times where there was no such thing as television, and the whole mentality of most of the world was how to make something out of nothing. I mean, the material nothing. So I grew up making um, paper dolls out of scraps of magazine colors. I would, I would cut out a section out of a magazine that was red and said, oh, this will make a nice little dress. We took the shirt cardboards that the shirts were laundered on and cut those and made those the dolls. And we put the tabs on. I remember having a dress that was made out of the less worn parts of a worn sheet. In those days, all this feeds into what makes you creative. It has to do with the fact that I believe everybody is creative, but there needs to be certain things fit into that so that they can see in everyday life that everything is a process of making and becoming. And it's much, much more important than drawing pretty pictures. It's much it's part of the education of the whole person, that education of the spirit, the creative spirit. We'd have no inventors if people were not thinking creatively. It was a combination of that creative thinking and mathematics that made us come up with, for example, um, uh, uh, manufacturing automobiles through robotics. That didn't come from somebody fitting themselves into a box or living in a corporation, working in a corporation where somebody slapped their wrists because they came up with an idea that did not fit with whatever the structure was. So it's in a very, very important thing. I'm diverging. Back to the dress. In those days, if you had a double